Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another event hosted by the Language Collaboratory. We're a partnership for the advancement of intercollegiate dialogue on the teaching of languages and cultures, driven by language centers and institutes at the University of Iowa, University of Michigan, University of Minnesota, Michigan State University, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Our aim is to provide collaborative professional learning opportunities for educators of language, culture, and literature at the five institutions. Our series this spring aims at furthering conversations that help uncover the complexities of striking a balance on professional, academic, and personal goals to achieve the well being of instructors and students of languages. We address this issue through the lens of our current shared circumstances, approaching it from a variety of perspectives and building on the experiences and expertise of individuals on our own campuses. We aim to share insights and to encourage interinstitutional dialogue bridging the institutional distance and fostering a collaborative interchange of ideas. You are invited to participate to what we hope uh, will be a lively discussion. Um, our sessions will be recorded and made available through each institution's website. We ask that you mute your microphone at the outset, that you use the tools in Zoom to contribute questions and comments in the chat, and during the open discussion period to raise your hand virtually prior to activating your microphone. Closed captioning is available through the live transcript button in the Zoom menu bar. Our next event um, will be um, uh, held next Monday on February 15th at this time, hosted by the University of Iowa and addressing the work-life balance in language teaching. Today's host is the University of Michigan. And um, I turn the floor over to Julie Evershed, the director of the Language Resource Center at the University of Michigan. Julie. Thank you, Dan. Um, I am very pleased to welcome Sabine Gabaron to our session today. Sabine is a lecturer in the Department of Romance, Languages and Literatures at the University of Michigan. Uh, she is a native speaker of French and has coordinated elementary French for a few years and has been teaching uh, across the curriculum. Since her first year as an instructor, she's been interested in developing new teaching techniques involving technology, encouraging meaningful communication in the classroom, and motivating students to express their passions and interests in the foreign language in order to feel empowered and individually successful. So Sabine, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Let's start out our conversation. Your topic is balancing academic rigor with flexibility in language courses. And how about we start, um, why don't you tell us what courses you're currently teaching and what um, kinds of things you've implemented to create more flexibility in your classes, especially in the remote environment. Hello, everyone. So um, this semester, I teach uh, three different sections. I teach a fourth semester uh, French 232 comics class. It's part of the language requirement. Um, I teach um, a graduate course on French reading. And then I teach also a, um, a course for the, uh, for the minor and the major, uh, which is medical French. Um, and so those students are a little more interested in the, in the topic than the um, than the students who are taking the the, the course the, the French two thirty two comics, which is for the requirement. Um, but so so last semester I was also teaching different um, different classes. One of them being also two thirty two, the same level as I'm teaching right now, and um, and so I quickly noticed that I had to become more flexible. Um, in order to, to be teaching uh, in the remote um, setting, but I couldn't lower my, my expectations. I teach within a program with certain goals and, um, and, and we have projected outcomes. So I, I'm not at liberty to do whatever I want, but so I wanted to make sure that I was um, adding more flexibility to the classroom and also myself um, while teaching um, in that environment. So. In the fall um, last semester, I started experimenting um, several ways in several ways, different ways that I could be adding flexibility. I surveyed my students throughout the semester. Uh, I used what they had said and then the feedback at the end of the semester. Um, 
And with what I tried in the fall, I saw my first observations were that they were more engaged. They had um, learned more than I thought that they uh, that I had expected. That they had developed an interest in the language. They had improved their skills. So, so I thought, okay, well, I'm going to really try and implement these things right from the start this semester and see where it goes. Um, so, there's several things in that I have um, implemented at the beginning of the semester. Um, for me, as an instructor, um, I made it flexible in the sense that I, I have a less rigid syllabus. Um, I would call this like a liquid or fluid syllabus. So this is um, for myself. Then there are three things for the students on the student side. So I offered deadline extensions on assignments right at the beginning of the semester. I offered multiple ways of submitting assignments and then also multiple ways of engaging in the classroom. Um, so these are the four things that, that I implemented in terms of flexibility. So the first one regarding the syllabus, less rigid, um, what, what I did is that, so I organized my syllabus the way that I, that I used to in the past with fixed dates, with exams that were really important uh, at the end of a chapter, for example. Um, but I, I removed some of the little assignments um, that were less important um, to give me some space for, to move things around um, throughout the semester and to modify lesson plans. So again, I work in a certain, um, there's a certain rigidity and there's certain things that I need to address and I have to go um, to, to do my, the program. Um, but I'm, I'm giving students weekly homeworks and in those weekly homeworks, I always think of what is it that I will be able to add later rather than take away. So, so when I'm thinking of my lesson plans, um, maybe I include 120% um, of what I think that I can do. Um, and then I ask students to prepare for maybe 80% of those 120%. So that gives me the opportunity to add more if I need to. Um, but I feel that telling students, um, oh, we're not going to do this because we don't have time, then it sort of brings anxiety to them. And, and, it, and then it doesn't give the, I, I feel the impression that um, I know where I'm going. Um, and so, so I feel that students need the stability and they need to know where they're going and they need to feel that I also know what I'm doing. Um, so I think that by, by removing some of those due dates and by giving me that space, it's giving me some peace of mind um, and I feel a little more relaxed in how I teach and, um, and I can move within that structure. Um, so in order, uh, regarding the deadlines, extension of deadlines, um, so what I do is sort of with that same idea is that I offer extensions right away and I tell students, so this is the due date for the assignment, but if you need a couple more days, um, you can turn things in a little bit later. Um, I explained to them my rationale and why I decided that this would be the due date. And I think that it makes sense with what we're doing and you should be able to do it um, by that time. But if something happens, you also have the option of turning, in, um, turning, turning it um, in a little bit later. To my surprise, um, very few students use the extension because they understand the reasoning behind the due date. And, and then I tell them, if, if you don't turn things uh, by the due date, then other things will pile up. So it's a, it's a matter of um, organizing your schedule. But, but with, by me giving them that extension um, right up front um, gives them the impression that I'm flexible and that I am aware that there might be issues um, and, and that I'm listening to, to their needs. Um, then the third thing was about submitting assignments, multiple ways of submitting, assign of submitting assignments. So what I've done, um, for example, is for the final project. So the final project, I have told them that they could actually turn it in in many different ways. They could turn in a video, they could turn in um, a newsletter, PDF style, slides, blog posts, any other format of their choices. I had to... Um, agree with them first, if they had an idea, then they would just submit it. Um, 
And so I thought this would be added work at first, but in the end, it made it easier for me because it was there was more variety. So it was more interesting. It was more fun. Um, the work came in the fact that I had to make sure that the rubric allowed for all those differences and for all the differences in format that I would get. Um, so it wasn't more work. It was just some rethinking about how I wanted to assess um, and how I wanted to create my rubrics. Uh, but it worked really well. The students were, um, they really appreciated all those choices. They were able to produce their best work because they had chosen the best platform to show off what they had learned. They felt empowered. They were really motivated to show their best work. Um, so that was also my way of adding flexibility. Um, and then the last point was giving multiple ways of engagement in the classroom. Um, so I give students, for example, I give students choices. I tell them you can raise your hand physically or you can use the Zoom feature with a raised hand or um, you can type in the chat an individual message to me or to the classroom or you can just start talking. Um, and so I, I think that they know that they have all these choices, but, but sort of by telling, by me telling them, then they feel that everybody has um, the choice to interact the way that fits them um, best. Um, so these are concrete examples of flexibility that students can quantify. Um, but there are also, I feel, other ways to add a sense of a sense of flexibility in the classroom. Um, and so I've tried doing this by creating an environment where everybody feels heard, um, where we connect on a human level, um, where students can come into the Zoom classroom um, in many different ways, ways that fits them best. And then um, also where students also participate in establishing rubrics. Um, so, so that's another aspect of flexibility that, um, that I have brought to the classroom. Um, well, I think that's kind of where that brings the rigor into the class, but it seems like you do it in a very collaborative participatory way. And, um, I know when we were talking about this earlier, this was really fascinating to me, how, how you set this up, but then the, the results you got from that. Yes. Yeah, so I, I'm going to start with the, the last point, the participating in establishing rubrics. Um, and so what I, I asked students to reflect at the beginning of the semester um, about misunderstandings that can happen over Zoom, for example. What, what, is the, what does the instructor see and what are some misunderstandings that can happen? Um, and, so, and so students came up with this idea of interpretation. Um, we as instructors don't always understand what is going on behind the screen and we have to interpret what we see. Um, and then I, I asked students, so, so what do you think is the most difficult for instructors to evaluate when you think of participation? And what would be the description for an A for you in participation according to you? And I had students brainstorm um, and they, they gave me, um, they gave me some, some ideas of what they thought and and so I had chosen not to give a rubric for the participation in my syllabus at the beginning of the semester on purpose because I wanted them to have that reflection of how is my participation going to be evaluated, what is the instructor going to be able to see, and, and what is going to transpire. Um, and so they worked collaboratively and they came up with the rubric. And what was interesting is that the rubric they came up with was very similar to the one that I had, that I had not shared, that I had kept on the site. Um, and then I showed them the rubric that I had and, and I told them you were able to identify exactly what I am going to look at and how I'm going to evaluate your participation. And so that way, everybody's on the same page. It came from them. Um, they thought about all the different criteria, what was difficult, what was visible, how they could show that they were more engaged. Um, and so we, 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 just, we came together uh, to an agreement on what was the expectation for good participation. Um, and so, so I thought that worked really well in terms of making sure that now everybody understands what they're, uh, what they're supposed to be doing when they're participating in class. Um, so also in terms of 
in terms of creating this environment where everybody feels heard, I think it's important just to set the tone in the classroom and then and, and then to create an environment well, where they will feel comfortable giving their best. Um, there's, I, I feel there's a connection between uh, what you can ask and how students feel in the classroom. So I also ask students to think about what was um, intimidating for them um, when they were in a remote setting. Uh, what were things that students would say or would do that um, would not enable them to participate or um, or to give their um, their best within that environment, and and then. So I asked students to answer questions on a Google form to bring the and I brought all those answers to class and then I asked students to find solutions to those problems. And we created the rules as a group and we used this final document as a reference um, for class and okay, this is how we're going to interact with each other and um, this is how um, we are going to give each other feedback and uh, this is what we expect one another to be doing in the classroom setting and in the breakout room. Um, I have found this to be extremely productive because um, I feel that students, they have been participating um, without even me asking them to do more. Uh, they're always ready, they uh, speak in French, they uh, interact, they're happy to be in the classroom um, because they have that, um, that sense of comfort and because they uh, trust one another and because they trust the environment to be an enriching environment for them where they're heard and where, um, where they can express themselves freely. Um, so we have a, a couple of questions. Um, one question is, would you be willing to let us have a peek at your participation rubric? I love the idea of co-creating it with your students. Um, so a peek now? Or you know what, you could um, send it to me and I could share it with the group. So sure. either way works <laughs> if you don't have it readily available. <laughs> no, I don't have it here. And although I could look for it, um, we don't have much time. So right, right. I, yes, of course. Great. And the second question is participating in developing, um, yeah, let me make sure I've got the right one. Participation in developing the rubric, a really good idea, it gives them some ownership of the evaluation as well as getting feedback with your grading. Oh, sorry, the, the questions were jumping. I'm wondering where is a healthy border between flexibility to submit assignments and a bit later in abuse of favor? I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat the question? Right, so basically, um, how do you determine where to set that, um, that line of where is, uh, where's the healthy line um, uh, and flexibility between allowing the students um, a bit more time and but not um, having them take advantage of that and abusing that deadline, that extension? So what I've, I've done is that I've always said you have either two or three days, and then I, I said it, so I choose either it's two or three days. Um, and I tell them this is to accommodate if anything comes up uh, and if you run into issues or um, if you need more time. Now, of course, sometimes students maybe have something where they get sick and they need an extra week instead of an extra day, uh, instead of just a couple of days. And then the way that I do, that I do this is that I tell them, um, if these two days are not enough, get in touch with me and I will be ready to have a discussion with you. And we can, I can maybe give you an extra um, extension if you are really sick or if, some, if there's an emergency because emergency happen. Um, but this, actually never happened to me. I think that um, I think that I am really open in the classroom and I tell them things happen in life. Um, for example, I just realized that I teach during my um, my son's jazz class and he plays the saxophone and this happened the other day. It was the very first day of class and I was like, oh no, and we were hearing the saxophone and I and I was very genuine and then I shared that with them and I said okay well this is life happening 
my mic will be on you might be hearing some saxophone playing um and and they laughed and so i really try to connect with them on a human level to show them that whatever they go through I probably go through too as well. And I share that with them. Um, for example, today I'm standing because I have a, a huge backache and my students noticed that I was standing and that I was not sitting. And I told them and I said, okay, today I don't feel that well, so I'll be standing. Um, and so I share things with them like that so that they, they, they make the human connection and they see that I understand when things happen. And I think that by doing it that way, they don't they don't abuse the system or, or they don't ask for things that are unreasonable because they know that there's a human on the other side that also goes through certain things but then that i also provide quality work and and um i i'm there for them i'm I, i'm ready to teach and uh so, so they see that I am providing quality and that I'm expecting quality from them. And it's sort of a, it's a contract that we have, um, that I have with them. And, um, and I've, I, I have not experienced students who keep on asking for deadlines. So I'm sorry, this is not really a good answer to the question. Um, I, I, I really feel that by creating this human relationship, um, by by i often tell my students um i have to trust you and you have to trust me it's trusting relationship even more so on on uh, on zoom even more so in a remote setting it has to be a, a trusting relationship um and i feel it has worked great can you you talk a, a lot about what you um what you prepared for this semester and what you've already implemented and have going, do you have advice or suggestions for someone who's maybe starting to think about it now when we're already a few weeks to a month into the semester? So, I mean, I, I think um, it's never too late to engage students in a rubric process. Um, rubrics can change and rubrics can evolve throughout a semester um, and then if if there has been an if there was an assignment um, that was given and then some grades that were that were given with that assignment, the following assignment that is maybe if it's a writing, let's say you have to write a paragraph, um, then you can have a different rubric for the second paragraph and you can use the first paragraph as a starting point and saying, okay, how how can you all improve? What are the things that um, that we would want to include more in this rubric or make um, or, or, or change or um, make it more effective for your second paragraph. And then um, have students be engaged at that point. I don't see why it has to be done uh, at a certain point in the semester. This is something you can be doing um, throughout the semester. And then also add a variety uh, of choices for future assignments. Um, for example, think of assignments um, that you can give down the road where you would um, tell students, okay, you can choose the, the, the way that you want to, um, to turn in this assignment, or you, you can do it handwritten, or you can take a picture, or you can type it, or um, just add that flexibility. Um, and then also the connecting with students individually. Um, this can be done at any point throughout the semester. Um, I, I, I really think that connecting with students um, whether it's as a group or individually it is really important in the remote setting. Um, last last week, for example, we were running late and students saw that we were not able to do what I had planned, but they had there was such a great engagement in the classroom. They were asking so many questions. It was super interesting. And then I told them at the end, um, okay, we didn't have time to finish, um, but that's okay, we'll continue later. And then we ended the class and I sent them an email afterwards and I thanked them for their participation because I didn't want them to feel bad about the fact that, okay, we, didn't, we weren't able to finish everything, but it was actually wonderful. And so I sent an email to the whole class and I said, thank you so much for such a great participation. You were so engaged. Um, it's okay that we didn't have time to finish. Um, we'll, we'll have time to do something more uh, with this, uh, but keep it up. This was a great class. And just by, I think, doing those little things throughout the semester creates that connection. Great. 
So do you, have you been thinking about what you're going to bring with you when we go back, if, if and when we go back to face-to-face -face classes? So I'm going to include more students in the process, that's for sure. Um, I, I really want to make sure that, um, yeah, that I'm including them more at different levels. Um, I'm going to keep on giving them more choices, um, very, also varying the way that I give feedback. Um, I have, I've started something uh, differently. It, I've started doing something differently in terms of uh, how I give feedback to students. Um, before I used to do it always the same way, handwritten. Now I give um, different types of feedback. I, I meet with students um, individually and I give them oral feedback. Um, and then I write on my iPad with different colors. Um, or, um, or I give a little video or, and I really think this is great because it addresses all the different types of students. It addresses the visual students, the auditory students. Um, so this, I really want to include a lot more, um, varying the ways that, the ways that I give feedback, um, to the students. Um, there, there's one thing that I would like to add if I can, in terms of, um, the expectations and, I, I've really, I really think that I have been asking myself this semester, um, I, I've been telling myself that I have to be more aware of how I convey these uh, expectations. And uh, it's not just a matter of having expectations, but how do you convey them? And so I really think that being transparent is, is something essential. Um, and so I show them how I teach. I, I share with them my, um, my, my desktop and they see how I see them. They see that they're visible to me the entire time. That even if I do a presentation, I always have um, like a window open with every single student on there. And I see them, I see them raise their hands. I see them interacting. They're always visible. So, so, so the fact that I'm being transparent on, on what I do, how I teach and how I, I evaluate their work, I think um, sets the expectations and then creates that trust um, that we were talking about. Um, and, and then I also, I also try to make them experience um, rather than, uh, for, for example, um, for expectations, instead of writing things out, I put them in situations where they have to experience the situation and then evaluate the situation. So I did something with the whiteboards, for example, where I, I asked students to go to breakout rooms and do something on a whiteboard. Um, and then I closed the rooms and then I had them come back into the main room. And then I asked them, can you please share the whiteboard? And no one had their whiteboards to share because they didn't know that, that this is what I wanted. And so, and so then we had the discussion, okay, so what were my expectations were? They were not very clear. You did not know that you had to save that whiteboard. Well, I can tell you that the whiteboard is saved somewhere. And then I walked them through and then we looked at where the whiteboard was. And, and by, so by experiencing this difficulty or this, oops, I didn't know we were supposed to do that. And, oh, that's what I can do. Then now I don't need, I don't need to explain it anymore. Now they automatically go to a breakout room, they share their, their screens, they use a whiteboard, they know where it is, they have it ready to share. And so that, that sort of sets the expectation um, and it makes them more tangible for them because they have experienced the issue or the problem or that they went through the whole thing and they thought about um, the process. Great, so I see we are exactly at five o'clock, great timing. Um, if you have a few minutes to stay on um, for any additional questions, we'll all plan on staying, uh, the, the organizing group will plan on staying on till 515. So anyone is welcome to stay um, and ask additional questions or have um, additional conversation around this. I know I saw Kate's hand up um, earlier. Kate, do you still have a question? I mostly just wanted to say thank you because I'm doing a lot of the things that you mentioned and I feel validated <laughs> listening to you so so thank you for doing that and I for sharing all of that and I also just I had a contribution to the question about um, flexibility with deadlines. One of the things that I do is give students an opt out possibility so 
not for the big assignments that they do, but for some of the more regular small ones, they can opt out of doing assignments um, anytime they want to and not be penalized. And they have a certain number of assignments that they can opt out of without any penalty to their grade. So that if things come up in their lives or they're overwhelmed by their work, they can opt out of an assignment and not feel stressed out about missing it. So it's just another strategy for, for being flexible. Um, can I just cut in for just a second and um, uh, advertise our next session? Um, again, our next session is going to be next Monday, uh, coming to us from the University of Iowa, working on work-life balance and language teaching. I also wanted to mention uh, the last time to mention our upcoming conference on Saturday morning. Uh, it's going to be a series of lightning talks at the Midwest Association for Language Learning Technology, and $20 gets you admission and access to every session, which will be recorded um, afterwards, uh, because you actually become a member. Uh, so think about that, and we're also going to be sending you an evaluation of today's session. So look for that as well. Um, <clears throat> one thing I wanted to mention is that um, I think this was an excellent transition from last semester's topic to this semester's topic. When we were talking about um, um, accessibility, inclusivity, and, and learner autonomy, um, one of the issues that we had was, boy, it just, you know, incorporating all of this just takes a lot more effort. But you've been able to show us that it actually Im improves your life by, um, by in, um, allowing students more of a say in their own, in their own participation and the work they do.